Hello, it's Michael again, and we are back with more tips about how to break down an academic article as you enter your scholarship as a scientist or a sociologist, social scientist, hard scientist, any type of scientist. Um, you will see more and more articles that deal in studies. Studies can be very hard to decipher, especially if you haven't done one in your academic career. So this little tutorial is to help you to understand what to expect and how to face those challenges. Up until now, the texts you've read were facts and edicts that you couldn't really argue with, right? Somebody gave you a text, they were gonna test you out of exactly what the text said. You might've been asked to think critically or combine some of the issues in that text, but it really was just the text telling you what was true and you just accepting it. As you look, at academic articles, you have to realize that these are half of a conversation or half of an argument that the authors are making. You are the other half. So instead of just accepting things as facts, the new rule is, is this right? Does this meet procedure? Does it agree? So now we're not going to look to the text for answers. We are going to look to the text with questions. So the breakdown of most academic articles, I'm not talking about the one that talk about literature, I'm talking about the ones that talk about studies, um, start with an abstract or summary, then you'll have an introduction, a literature review, methods, results, discussions, and conclusions. This could look different. Um, there could be a different, you know, there might be only four of these or five of these, but uh, for the most part, this is what you're going to see. So beyond the elements of the article itself, there are some things that you can, should consider. You should always consider the date written. You can actually limit the date on most databases to the most recent. I like to say within the last 15 years, it depends on the type of research you're doing. But if you're trying to formulate something, if you're trying to see if something is valid, you really want the most up-to-date sources. The next thing you need to think about is corroboration. Is this person a lonely island? Is this the only study that says this, right? This is what we see with a lot of uh, news in health right now is that like two people say it on YouTube and then we all take it as fact. But it, two people saying it doesn't really make something fact when it comes to a study. You really want to find as much corroboration as you can. And it may not be the exact same thing, but it should be fairly similar. You want to think of the lo longitudinal application. That's fun to say. Meaning... <laughs> Um, are there studies that have been done on this issue for a long time? And you might not be able to find this on things like COVID or COVID vaccinations, but you can find this on vaccinations in general, right? We've been giving each other vaccines for a really long time. I think Abigail Adams had a smallpox vaccine, right? Or some element of it to inoculate herself. So um, you may not be able to find longitudinal application on these on your issue specifically, but you should be able to find it in the realm of the things that you're talking about. You need to think of the sources your source is using and are the dates of those sources current and do those sources have authors that have strong standing in the field. Uh, if your author is pulling random people from YouTube or articles that don't come from accredited uh, bodies or peer review journals, then the things that they're writing aren't necessarily all that accurate. So beyond the things that, of the actual breakdown of the study itself, those things are some things that you might want to give some thought to. So the abstract is how you begin and how you end. So the abstract usually gives you a general idea of what to expect within the paper. Um, I generally like to read a bunch of abstracts. Like I get a lot of research, I get a lot of articles, and then I just start reading abstracts to see what can best help me with my particular field of research. Abstracts are pretty quick. They tend to be less than 500 words, so they're usually no more than two paragraphs. Um, so I always start with the abstract. But then once I read the entire article, I go back to the abstract to see if it was accurate at all. Um, you will be amazed at how many times you will see the same names in, in your field of study. So if you're noticing that that person's just not very good at writing abstracts, it may not be something that's good for you. So you want to read it before you start, and then you want to read it um, after you end. Uh, and finally, you want to keep in mind that an abstract is going to be largely optimistic about what the study aims to do, right? So even if the study completely fails 
if all of their methods aren't very good, the abstract is still going to say, this is what we were trying to do. So the abstract is going to probably feel very optimistic um, and it might present some big, huge aims. But remember, most studies are not going to present anything that's like revolutionary, right? Most studies are going to present something relatively simple and straightforward. Um, so if the abstract is huge, you might want to put on your skeptical eye before you move forward. Next part is the introduction, and the introduction is basically going to tell you what's the point? Why am I reading this? So this will give you a brief overview of the problem and a bit of context. No strong study is not going to address a problem, right? If there is no problem, what are you studying? If there is no question, what are you answering in the course of the study? So when you're reading the introduction, you want to ask yourself, is there bias in who is performing the study and the study's focus? For instance, for a really long time, the only people doing any research about tobacco was the tobacco industry. Currently, the only people doing any research on gambling addictions are casinos and gambling enterprises. So you always want to ask yourself, like, where's the bias? Who's paying for it? And you should see that in the introduction when it presents the problem and you get an idea of who the authors are. Is this a simple question with a more straightforward answer? Very often we ask big, big questions in studies. Sometimes the answers are huge. Sometimes they're not. Um, if you think about some of the things that something like the Bill Gates Foundation has done, um, you see that sometimes the answer is clean running water. It's not a new drug. It's not a new treatment plan. It's clean water so that people can wash their hands, right? So is this a question with a more straightforward answer is always what you want to ask yourself as you're looking at the research questions. Has this question already been answered? Sometimes you're going to come across articles and you're really going to wonder why this needed to be said for the 400th time. It has been said a lot. It doesn't need to be said again. Now, this doesn't happen often, but it is something to think about as you're reading the introduction. And finally, is the question relevant to your research respected? Um, so that basically means, I know that's awkwardly worded, but that basically means is, are they actually answering a part of my research? Like, uh, the, if I'm writing something on education of 18 to 20 year olds in Tennessee, is this research done on 18 to 20 year olds in China? Cause that's not gonna help me, right? I might be able to get some ideas, but I should look for better sources before I use that one. The next section is the literature review. And the literature review is going to provide some context of how this particular study stacks up to other studies like it. So you want to think of the research world as a big, long timeline. And usually literature reviews are sort of organized by chronology. Like this is where we started. This is where we're going. This is how to think about the things that are happening right now. Now, some articles don't have a lit review. Um, a lot of journals give you a page limit and usually the lit review is the first thing to go. But a lit review can be really great for a couple reasons. One, it gives you context. Two, it, it informs why the things that come after it are happening. And three, you can use that research in your research, right? If they're using great research on that article, you can kind of use it to pull and pick new pieces. So you want to ask yourself, is the literature review balanced? Are they only presenting one side of like this particular argument or this particular sort of view of the field? Um, is the literature reference pertinent? I can't tell you how many literature reviews I've gotten to the middle of and I'm like, why am I here? What, what are you talking about? What does this have to do with anything? Um, does the work use major or seminal sources on the issue? If you are writing about relativity and you do not reference Einstein, we're going to have a problem, right? Even though a lot of his theories have been debunked, um, you still have to talk about that if you're talking about this field. So you want to be thinking, are the works seminal? Is there enough historicity? Do they go back far enough? You know, one of the things I see in a lot of medical journals is research that starts within the last 20 years. Um, and, and sometimes that's fine, depending on how new the method is. But like I said earlier about the vaccine, sometimes we have really long longitudinal data to pick from, and we really should. 
um, is an inappropriate preview of what's to come. Are you looking at that literature review and then you hit the method section and you're like, I don't, I don't know where that came from. I don't know how those two things are connected. Everything in this work is going to be connected in some way. And are the connections made through methods, results, and conclusions, right? That's what I mean by is an inappropriate preview. And as you're asking these questions, you're probably wondering to yourself, okay, well, what do I do if something is no? Well, that's what you report on, right? If the literature review isn't strong, you say, well, I'm not really sure where they came up with these methods because it wasn't listed. Um, but and that becomes more important as you go along. So the methods, how is this going to work at all, right? And this is where we stop because you might get a red flag by this point. If by the end of your method section, your authors have not outlined very clearly who their population is, you might as well turn around, right? Because you don't, you're not going to have any idea the validity of those results. You could be reading something that says, um, sunshine gives you superpowers. And then you realize that their population was Clark Kent, right? Like if you don't know what the population is by this point, you can go ahead and throw out that study. It's not going to help you with your research. It's not going to help you with your writing. So the method section is where the authors perform what they uh, outline what they performed. Um, so often, so often, it is very obvious that students are not reading this section. Read this section. It is the most important part of the paper because if they mess up, mess up the methods, Nothing that comes after it matters, right? Nothing that came before it matters because the methods are messed up. So if you look at the results and you're like, these are great results. I mean, they did some amazing things. And then you realize within their methods, they didn't sanitize something or they didn't follow proper protocol. So therefore what they did isn't possible and it's not generalizable and it's not replicable. The method should be repl replicable. Um, then you know that the, the study isn't very strong, right? And believe it or not, your professors want you to understand whether a study is strong. Your professors want you to understand whether or not this particular article, this particular study is worth your time. Because if you're referencing it and you're standing on it for your own research and it's not strong, then your own research falls. So when you're looking at methods, you want to ask yourself, is the population of appropriate size and range for generalization? This is one of the issues that we see in a lot of medical trials, right? They're only choosing white men um, of a certain socioeconomic level. And then they're trying to generalize that population to all ethnicities and all genders. And it doesn't work. Um, are the methods best for your intended results? You know, if you're trying to figure out if a drug is effective, Surveys are probably not your best bet. If you're trying to figure out if a drug has horrible side effects, surveys may be part of what you use. So you want to ask yourself, are the methods actually appropriate for what you're trying to figure out? Um, are the tests appropriate for the questions? For instance, a t-test would be appropriate for comparison, but not so great if you're trying to figure out something like causation. Are the methods ethical? We have seen so many studies and people reference so many studies that just weren't done ethically. And then you realize, well, if I if it's not ethical, then I can't replicate it. And the key word for methodology is replicable. Can someone else do this and get the same results? Because if they can't, then we have to throw out the baby with the bathwater and we have to say, well, that was interesting, but it's not going to work. And does the research support this methodology? When you look at the literature section, when you look at other research on this area, does it support using these methods to find the answers to these questions? Results. Obviously, your results are, so then what happened, right? So here's where the author quantifies the results. I'm going to warn you, the results section is scary. So later uh, on the pharmacy page, uh, we also have a quick guide to help you understand the types of tests that are done in most studies and how to recognize the results and what those results mean. I know looking at t-tests and ANOVAs and partial correlation and z-scores and p-values seems very confusing and it is. It's a bunch of Greek letters and numbers. So don't get overwhelmed. Just know that what you're looking for is statistical significance. 
basically you're asking, do we reject our null hypothesis or do we accept our null hypothesis? And if there's statistical significance, then what you do is you reject your null hypothesis. And if there isn't, you accept it. So instead of getting overwhelmed, we're going to use our guide to help us understand these, these numbers and letters and all those things. But we're also going to understand at the end of the day what we need to understand. Well, were these results statistically significant? Did something actually happen that matters is the only question that we need to ask. And again, don't be disappointed if it's like, nah, it didn't work. Most studies don't work, <laughs> right? Um, a lot of studies are not going to present you with new information. Science runs, but it runs in small steps. If ever you see a huge leap in science, you should always kind of have your like, hmm, I wonder what's going on there <laughs> kind of thing. So stuff to ask yourself when it comes to results. Is there any statistical significance? Are the results generalizable? And this is why we talk about replicating the methods, right? If I can't replicate, if I can't do it, then they're not generalizable. Um, do the results answer the question? Do they have anything to do with what we initially started to do? Was any of the data excluded for whatever reason? You know, if they say we didn't get enough feedback or these we uh, excluded data that was very negative or very positive to try not to skew our information. Why was that data excluded? That happens upon occasion. Was there anything surprising in the data? And did the data support the previous research in that literature review? Discussion is where we turn the results into a narrative. So. We're going to consolidate all of that information and sort of give the general public an idea of what they're actually seeing, right? Um, still, though, discussion should not have a lot of opinion or conjecture. Discussion is just an explanation of what happened. Try to consider yourself someone sitting, sitting on a witness stand and we're just repeating the facts in a way that makes sense, but also kind of giving them some context in terms of the research that we saw before. In your discussion section, you want to ask yourself, does the discussion match the results that we saw? Did the authors recognize the limitations of their own processes? If there is nothing in your work that says, here's what went wrong, or here's why this particular information isn't generalizable, or here are some limits to what, why this uh, couldn't be replicated, then you want to ask yourself why. Right. There's always some issue in a study that makes you kind of go, well, I can't do it because of this. So you really want to make sure that they're recognizing limitations. Did they use all the data or did they pick and choose the pieces that assist their narrative? Right. When you were looking at all those charts and all those numbers and all those letters, do you see enough of that information in the discussion section? Do you have any questions that are still unanswered as a fellow scholar? Are you still wondering what's going on? And finally, do they corroborate or contradict previous research in that literature review that you saw or even your own previous research that you've seen? Finally, there's a conclusion. And in the conclusion, we widen the scope. So this is where authors can make assertions or generalizations about the results they found, right? So it could be something like, we saw this happen in this population. We think it can happen in other populations because of A, Y, and Z. That's what I mean because of by generalizations. So when you're reading the conclusion section, you want to ask yourself, are they asserting logical connections? Can the study be truly generalized or is it limited for some reason? Did the authors admit to any issues that you or they found, right? You could be reading a study and it's going to occur to you, nah, that ain't right. Right. Did they actually address your issues as you saw it? Because, again, you're talking to the text and you're asking questions the entire time. That's why we're going through this. It's not simply I'm accepting everything they did as truth and gospel. So did you did they answer any questions that you found or that they found as they went through the process? Um, did they bend the results to meet a bias? Right. Did they change the language to make things sound better? That kind of thing. And finally, are they using the proper language to discuss their results, right? We see a lot of people talking about correlation as though it is causation. And so you want to make sure that when they are talking, what they are concluding is actually true and valid to um, what their results are saying. So again, 
Don't be afraid. I know it seems like a lot to do, but now as you're moving into your own scholarship, you really need to be able to understand how to integrate, like how to interrogate and integrate new knowledge, right? So I get this new knowledge. Yes, I do have to integrate it into my old knowledge, I have to understand what I'm reading. But what's more important is you have to interrogate it, ask questions. Is it valid? Does it make sense? Can I really use this? Because what you're doing is you're building your own foundations and you want to build those on stone. All right. So if you have any questions about that result section and all those t-tests, just use our guide, <laughs> um, which is on our page for the pharmacy orientation. And it will certainly help you to kind of understand what kind of questions are being asked. So thank you for going through this journey and we will see you next time.